<clears throat> okay. Uh, happy birthday, Kenzo Tange. Um, born in 1913, and he had a long life. Uh, he died in 2005. So, uh, 92. Uh, Tange was uh, truly uh, a central figure in the in the in the development of modern architecture in uh, in, in Japan. There were a few other architects before him, um, you know, who could claim uh, as being originators of the modern movement, but uh, none of them actually built as he did and. Uh, he was very, very important also as an educator because he was a professor and uh, uh, he was associated with the metabolists, he even trained some of the future metabolists. So he was truly a, a ferment, a catalyst, a very important man in, um, in the architecture in Japan and in the world architecture. Here is a picture of him, uh, you know, near the building by Le Corbusier in, uh, in India. Uh, that Le Corbusier built for the, um, I don't know, the, the workers, the administration of the textile industry in Ahmedabad. Ahmedabad having a very strong, uh, you know, textile uh, or weaving industry. Uh, here he is in his older age. Um, he was also a, a public figure, um, quite good at public relations, and he received, you know, even late in his life, some very important commissions. And he was a special man, and uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I even had a chance uh, to, uh, you know, many years ago to uh, send the project to Japan which I did for a competition and he was in the jury and he had a few words there. Anyway, here he is again with his camera uh, contemplating actually a building that he, that he built. Uh, and um, he probably had some virtues in the field of negotiating with society as well. And architects do need those virtues. You know, it's not enough to do a, a great project if you are mute when you are to defend it or to sustain it, to present it. So you have to be a, a, you know, a, a person capable to articulate, to, to, to express your thoughts and your emotions vis-a-vis -vis the, the project and the issues that you are addressing. Uh, otherwise, someone who, who can do this with a lesser project can uh, win the commission. Here he is together with uh, some young architects. He's here in the middle. And I, I love this about uh, Japan, and not only about Japan, this, this, this uh, belonging to a cause, you know, and giving everything to that cause, you know, this dedication to uh, almost like a, like a samurai who was dedicated completely to the nobleman. Please be kind and turn off the microphone. Uh, thank you, unless you want to say something. Um, so we see here five architects like kind of like five samurai who fought for a cause. And I truly think we need something like this in our time too, and in our society too. You know, the architects to, to come together, to fight for a cause, to promote something unseen, unheard, unheard of, you know, new solutions, new problems, new, new even uh, idiosyncratic uh, uh, positioning vis-a-vis -vis architecture and life. We need an active, you know, body of, of, of architects. And uh, th these Japanese after the Second World War, uh, you know, they, they, uh, they emerged from the ashes. And in a few years, they, they were a dominant uh, uh, presence in, 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 in the world of, of, of architecture. And bravo to them. Uh, this is what he says. Architects today tend to depreciate, depreciate themselves to regard themselves as no more than just ordinary citizens without the power to reform the future. Kenzo Tange. Well, this relates to, to what I just said. I think if the architect continues to think that he or she is just, a, you know, a, you know a responding to some kind of a request um, or commission from some kind of a client or a beneficiary, betrays his or her deeper nature 
and not only nature, I would say, but also responsibility. It is my strong belief that an architect is a, 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 an agent of transformation of society and life. And if he or she doesn't do this, she, he or she betrays the very essence of what it means to be an architect. And, and Tange, as you see, thought in the same way. If you think of yourself as just being, uh, you know, uh, uh, a mercenary paid to do something, you'll remain that so-called ordinary citizen that Kenzo Tange talked about. I do believe that the architect has the power to reform the future, not in an arrogant way, but through a vision, through education, through inspiration, through intuition. There is a powerful need for symbolism. And that means that the architecture must have something that appeals to the human heart. You notice heart, not brain. There is a powerful need for symbolism. And that means the architecture must have something that appeals to the human heart. He said it twice, or anyway, this uh, IZ codes uh, uh, added uh, the same phrase twice. Symbolism. Are we talking about symbolism in our architecture? Not much, as far as I know. Are we talking about the human heart? Not much, as far as I know. But Tange does. Are we listening to Tange? Probably not. Inconsistency itself breeds vitality. This is also a very nice quotation from him, you know, because we are asked in the name of a dry rationalism to so-called be consistent. But inconsistency is actually the fluidity of water, of the river, of the clouds, is the, is the, is the vitality of life itself. So here, here is Kenzo Tange saying inconsistency itself breeds vitality. From that instability that inconsistent, inconsistency means, uh, the new is born. Vitality is born, a new life is born. Contradictions in this sense are good too. We shouldn't be afraid of contradictions. Anyway, so about the Isa Shrine, because I, I have myself, the book is a beautiful book. Unfortunately, it's a very expensive book. I, I was lucky to find it less expensive. Uh, it's about the Isa Shrine uh, and he, edited and I think even paid for that book. Uh, it's uh, called Ise, the prototype of Japanese architecture. So in 1953, Tange and the architectural journalist and critic Noboru Kawazoe were invited to attend the reconstruction of the Ise Shrine. The shrine has been reconstructed every 20 years. And in 1953, it was the 59th iteration. Normally, the reconstruction process was a very closed affair, but this time the ceremony was open to architects and journalists to document the event. The ceremony coincided with the end of the American occupation, not a little thing, and it seemed to symbolize a new start in Japanese architecture. In 1965, when Tange and Kawazoe published the book Ise, Prototype of Japanese Architecture, he likened the building to a modernist structure, an honest expression of materials, of functional design and prefabricated elements. Well, here he, nothing is said about the spirit of that uh, incredible building. And indeed, uh, the Ise Shrine is, is incredible. Kenzo Tange, uh, his own house from 1951, 1953. Uh, here you can still see you know, uh, the connection with what we call tradition, although he later claimed that tradition, although could be the base on which you start a project in the final, um, you know, uh, result, uh, or, or uh, he, uh, tradition um, uh, melts down, the tradition uh, becomes hidden. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't show itself explicitly. And I think he's right. Because if it does show itself explicitly, uh, 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 there is a great danger of falling in traditionalism and folkism and so on. Anyway, this is a modern building. I think it's a beautiful building, but it's also discreetly connected with what preceded it. 
And in this, uh, already Kenzo Tange showed himself as being a master. Because it's not easy to do this, to soften the presence of the roots that you inspire yourself from and to propose something that belongs to the present. Otherwise, the interior is, uh, you know, still very much so called Japanese. Um, uh, this building, uh, the beginning of his professional life, I, I, I think uh, deserves um, um, attention and study. Please be kind and turn off the microphone. Thank you. Okay, so here is the plot of land on which the, the building finds itself. Um, so uh, he was lucky, of course. I mean, you know, he had quite a quite a large piece of land considering how Japan is. But we are talking about a major architect. And even if this is his first building, he was already uh, on his way to what we might call uh, uh, stardom. I don't know exactly what the significance of this picture is, but uh, it intrigued me. Was it a cemetery there before or I, I don't know. Anyway, but here we see the building he built for the Hiroshima Memorial. Uh, and uh, we, we should never forget that Japan was, um, of course it lost the war, but it was bombed twice with an atomic bomb. On, in, uh, in Hiroshima and in Nagasaki. So he built in 1949 to 1956, the Hiroshima Peace Center. I called it the Hiroshima Memorial. Well, it's kind of the same thing. Uh, a resolutely modern building, a horizontal, clear line, uh, but that you can feel the will of the architect here. Uh, and, uh, I admire this building, you know, it's, it's, it's simple, uh, it's concise in a way, and it, 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 it expresses a will, the will of the Japanese people. Uh, and uh, I think the building still stands today uh, for, uh, uh, with the symbolism that uh, Tange intended. Of course, the Japanese can build anything and they build beautifully. I, I, you know, you wonder how come they can build like this? You know, even this is so-called simple building, you know, it's, look at the lines, they are perfectly, perfectly, uh, uh, you know, uh, not only drawn, but also built. Hiroshima from being completely destroyed is now a new city. It's a new city and a city with generosity. It's a city which is not um, adversely uh, oriented towards even those who bombed it. So Jetsu Art Center, 1955-1957. Um, his architecture is, uh, is vigorous, you know, even when he uses simple volumes, there is an obvious uh, vigor uh, in, in, in his work. A lot of concrete, yes, but, uh, you know, at that time, there wasn't a concern as we have today for, um, you know, sustainability, concerns with pollution, and so on. Probably, if he lived today, Tange would have built differently. But I, I, I know that Kenneth Frampton appreciates very much Tange and the people, the architects who built around his time, and less the architects of the present from Japan, like, you know, Sejima or Ishigami or Ito and so on. 
but you know, regardless of what Kenneth Frampton thinks and said, if you analyze, if you compare the works of this heroic period in the Japanese architecture with the with the architecture of today, you 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 uh, you understand it's a big difference. But maybe in a certain way, even the the architecture of the present is heroic in a different way, very different way. Um, I think it's an interesting subject to, to address and perhaps to talk about. Imabari City Hall Complex from 1959. So more than 60 years ago, very vigorous. I'm afraid uh, Doshi inspired himself copiously from this project when he built something uh, quite similar in Ahmedabad. Anyway, uh, the influence is uh, coming in architecture from other architects uh, is sometimes hard to resist. I would, um, I would agree, but uh, <laughs> at this level, I, 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 I am coping. I, I, I was hoping that um, such transparent uh, similarities would be uh, avoided. Anyway. Um, Ka Kagawa, Kagawa pre prefectural government. I should learn some Japanese. Office uh, Japan in uh, from 1958. Uh, this is an office building. But if you look at the stones, the big rocks in front, you can see the romantic side of the Japanese spirit is still, or their love for nature is still uh, present, even in front of an otherwise, you know, Cartesian. Uh, uh, office building, but you know this this this, this office building has these uh, balconies all around it. So this is very uncommon. How many uh, you know office buildings do you know that have uh, something like this? So there is a gesture of openness that that uh, is not uh, typically associated with an office building at all. And the, and the rocks are uh, magnificent, I confess. Uh, and I hope you would agree with me. And even the concrete the behind, as you see, the, the, the texture, the way it is, uh, uh, you know, it presents itself to us. It, 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 it is not a, a banal one. It, it, has, it has a skin that, that has character. It has personality. So we see in the foreground the old, and we see in the background uh, the immediate uh, background uh, the new. A remarkable nation, as you know, I'm sure, uh, Japan. You know, they they uh, they work very hard. Some say that they are workaholics, but they they do incredible things in all fields, not just architecture. Whatever the Japanese do, they do it perfectly. This is a good building from 1960, Kurashiki City Hall, uh, and um, you know the the if you look at the plan, you don't expect. Uh, uh, maybe you know special things, but it's very it's very it's very clear. It's very simple. The material. I mean, this building qualifies for being brutalist. It's a brutalist building, uh, and um, you know, again, it expresses it expresses the heroic years of that period in Japan. They had to more to you know to 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 come together as a nation without complaining through hard work and 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 uh, you know start a new life and 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 they succeeded brilliantly even now Japan is one of the most powerful countries in the world in terms of its economy and so on and art and culture and so on they they, they are uh, you know. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I wonder what, how would Romania would look like if the Japanese were administering it? You know, uh, they are less fortunate than we are. But the exceptionalism of the, of the Japanese might have to do with the fact that they are the furthest east. They are, 
that's why it's the country where you know the sun rises you know uh, there is just the water beyond them and then the you know that east from which the sun rises so there is some ex exceptionalism uh, uh, you know uh, generated there in that place in that country from the even the you know the geographical conditions you know raw concrete can be very uh, stimulating you know it's not necessarily cold i mean after all we know that what he does with concrete and it would be a shame to cover that concrete with i don't know what plaster or some kind of so-called finishes but Frank Lloyd Wright didn't like concrete. He thought it was a conglomerate, but he used it sometimes too, but not, not, um, not uh, without some reluctance and not very, very often. Housing, 1961, um, row houses. In a rural setting. But you see, you know, rural setting through scale, but otherwise um, the modernity of the of the of this front of, of buildings is obvious. 1961, so exactly 60 years ago. Kenzo Tange. Cultural Center, 1963, Nichi Nan. Uh, this this I like because it has two opposing, well, they are not explicitly present in the plan, but you will understand from the elevation that uh, it is as if two uh, prisms, triangular prisms, uh, uh, oppose each other. You see it in the section and uh, you will also see it in the elevations. But it's like a fortress, concrete. Uh, you know, some people might say that it's too austere, it's severe, it is, but, um, you know, again, at that time, Japan was still adopting this heroic stance vis-a-vis -vis life in general and vis-a-vis uh, -vis architecture as well. And the patina of the concrete, in my opinion, has aesthetical virtues, artistical virtues, virtues. It's a cultural center, but isn't culture some kind of a bulwark of resistance where you try through culture heroically to oppose the banality of a life without a horizon, to oppose mercantilism, to oppose commercialism and so on. So in this sense, the symbolism of the building is correct. It is a fortress. It's the fortress of, uh, of art, of culture, of spirit. Kenzo Tange's buildings will make you believe in a better future. This is what this person said. Uh, and I guess this is because he was essentially an optimistic uh, creator, uh, very vital. And uh, he did believe in creativity and in resistance through creativity. Personally, I think this world is very moving, I mean, emotionally, because 
you know, yes, it has this patina. Some, some might say it's ugly. I don't think it's ugly at all. It's, it, it, it is emotionally charged through its shape, through its size, and even through its materiality, I think. Now, why this one is like this and the other one is different, I don't know very well, but uh, it doesn't matter. The, 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 the power of the vision is present. Somebody asked, why do the Japanese live the longest or almost the longest with some people from Singapore? They have the, the, the most impressive longevity. And uh, I read that it seems they are not afraid to die. They, they, don't, they don't hang on to their lives uh, in an in a, in a obsessive way. They, they don't think they are so important. So it doesn't really matter to them so much if they live or if they die. And... Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's not easy to, to think and feel in this way, but I guess it works for them. Anyway, it, I think this is a remarkable building and uh, is not the only one that he built in his uh, long life. We Japanese architects in our endeavors to resolve the problems facing modern Japan have devoted a great deal of attention to the Japanese tradition and have in the end arrived at the point which I have sought to elucidate for you. These are his words. If, however, there can be detected a trace of tradition in my works or in those of my generation, then our creative powers have not been at their best. Then we are still in the throes of evolving our creativity. I want by all means my buildings to be free of the label tradition. Of course, of course, he was a traitor. Yes, a traitor. The, the root of the word tradition is identical with the root of the word traitor. But a creator is a traitor in the, in the positive sense of the word. You betray tradition in order to make life possible. If you remain stuck in the, what is called traditional or tradition, you are not serving life. No, you are serving death. And uh, the traditionalists should understand this. So I'm totally on the side of Kenzo Tange in, in what he says here. You are supposed to move forward, just like a child, let's say, uh, the son of a or a daughter, 18 or 19 or whatever, around that time, you know, at one time you have to do, you have to leave your family. You do it with pain. Maybe you make some steps and then you turn your head and it's possible you have tears in your eyes, but you continue to walk away because you have to assert your own life. You cannot remain forever stuck to your parents is the same thing in architecture. It has to move forward. If it doesn't move forward, well, we arrive at stagnation, at uh, lack of life. Now, the Olympic Arena at Tokyo, at Tokyo in Japan in 1961, 1964, in my opinion, this, what he built here is, is superior to what Kengo Kuma built recently for the Olympics of 2020. It is true. The her her heroism of, of, of Kento's uh, time, at uh, that time, Ken Gokuma couldn't have now. And uh, a certain weakness, uh, maybe, um, but I don't know. I, um, maybe I'm not expressing myself very well. What I'm trying to say is that Ken Gokuma built a, a shaky, so to speak. Uh, it's not an iconic uh, big stadium, national stadium something that there is a virtue in this. But I don't know, because the very function in itself, a huge stadium, uh, is not the modest function in the world. So to express, to express architecturally such an ambitious uh, building in a um, so-called modest way is, um, 
little bit hypocritical, I would say. I would rather, I mean, I admire by comparison the buildings by, uh, by Kenzo Tange. You know, uh, uh, of course, the, he built them at a different time, but look at the simplicity, the beauty, and even the sensitivity of what he did. These are sports arenas, but, uh, but, 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 but they, they have uh, an artistic expression, an architectural expression, which uh, transcends, you know, the predictability of the function itself. Look at that roof. Look at that ceiling, look at the light, and look at the building from the outside. It's a vision. It's a visionary architecture. It's, he had a, an intuition, a vision, and they built it beautifully to perfection. I think Japan at that time was superior in the field of architecture to the Japan of today. Yes, Japan today still uh, is a force in architecture, but uh, I admire more somehow just like Kenneth Frampton does this kind of architecture, which is, um, which expresses a beginning. And Louis Kahn was right when he said beginnings are in harmony with the human nature. Now, of course, we cannot always be, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in that state of mind. We cannot always have that state of mind. Uh, and, um, in a, letter, in, a, in a letter I received from Frampton, uh, he's, he quotes from Antonio Gramsci, who apparently said, uh, you know, the old is dying and the new cannot be born. And in between, there are uh, morbid manifestations. And he, he, he quoted from Antonio Gramsci, by the way, of Frank Gehry's work. Now, I don't know, but we, we are at a time when Indeed, the old seems to be dying and the new is not yet able to come to life. And we don't know how that new might be, but I'm, I'm not sure that these, the, the, the intermediate uh, uh, products of our works are, um, uh, you know, useless or, uh, you know, morbid as, um, you know, the, the, the quotation from Antonio Gramsci um, uses. Anyway, uh, uh, Tange is in, uh, continues to be an inspiring force. I mean, look at this building. It's elegant and it's organic and it's uh, technologically, I mean, uh, uh, the, you know, it's, it's, it's advanced still. And uh, 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 there are two buildings and they are both, uh, I think, great. Because they express an aspiration. You know, it's an aspiration. You know, it, they open up both horizontally and vertically and the presence of the spiral and the twisting makes them uh, dynamic. 1960. Now, I don't know. Uh, someone is crying there. Uh, ah, yes. This is actually the proposal that Zaha Hadid made for the stadium of Japan for the Olympics uh, last year and this year, because last year uh, they were postponed for this year, and it was, um, it was not built. They chose instead to build, uh, you know, uh, a weak uh, building by um, Ken Gokuma, who apparently uh, inspired himself. I don't know exactly the details, but um, Zaha Hadid sued Ken Gokuma because uh, they thought, the office of Zaha Hadid thought that Kengo Kuma um, uh, copied certain things from her work. I didn't see that thing because the, 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 the stadium built by Kengo Kuma is very different from, uh, in my opinion, the better, more interesting project that Zaha Hadid did. And if I look at the work of Zaha Hadid here, I think she was closer in spirit to Kendo Tange with the works we just saw, much closer than uh, Ken Gokuma. Anyway, because this is what um, uh, Kendo Tange did, and this is what um, Zaha Hadid did. Anyway, the, the, I don't know why that word uh, appears there, it's, the, the building was never built, but anyway. Back to Kenzo Tange. 
all traces of what is called tradition disappear here. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a fresh new beginning. It's a modern building or there are two modern buildings. Sixty years ago, approximately. Okay, we move forward, and uh, uh, this one is the other smaller building uh, near the larger one. St. Mary's Cathedral. Yes, he built a cathedral. Now, I don't know. I don't think he was a Christian, but he built a cathedral. Uh, that is a Christian building, 1963. Architectural creation is a special form of comprehending reality. It works upon and transforms reality through the construction of a substantial object of use. The artistic form of this object, on the other hand, has the twofold quality of both mirroring and enriching reality. This understanding of reality, which takes place through architectural creation, requires that the anatomy of reality, its substantial and spiritual structure, be grasped as a whole. So, uh, you know, I think we can. <laughs> Paradoxical, you know, we are in Romania Christians, but I think we can learn about um, uh, Christianity in its true spirit from a Japanese like uh, Kento Tange, because we are building now a cathedral in Bucharest, which is the very opposite of uh, creativity. What can I say? It's very sad what is happening. Uh, now, you know, you might like this building or you might not like it, but it's a creation. It's something new. It's something that, look at this interior. You know, it's like a willful, it's like a, a, a geometrical cave. It's, 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 it's a cave. It's dark. It's, um, it's um, you know, uh, some might even think ominous in a way, but I think I think if you if you try to understand it better, it uplifts you, and it uplifts you because it is a it has an inner monumentality. It's not such a big building. The one built in Bucharest is much much bigger, but it has an inner monumentality and strength, and it doesn't need uh, you know uh, embellishments. Truth can be raw, and usually is raw. It doesn't need a makeup. It's the inner beauty. I think he did an excellent building. Uh, I like it more uh, inside, actually, than the outside. Uh, uh, a cathedral built by a Japanese man, you know, 60 years ago or so. Outside, in my opinion, is a little bit too slick, too, I, I, I don't know. But inside, uh, I think it has that rawness uh, that that uh, uh, make you um, you know uh, make you uh, feel alive. The cathedral of these fifteen thousand square meters and the capacity of six hundred seats was built between nineteen sixty three and nineteen sixty four. One of the things that struck me from the church, especially when compared with other Catholic cathedrals in Europe, Latin America, or Asia itself, in the Philippines, was it, it secluded, its, its secluded um, uh, uh, character. That is, there is not a square or a public open space preceding the cathedral as is common in the Western tradition. On the contrary, the church is located next to a highway hidden behind other buildings, and one can only have an idea of its size and magnificent proportions when viewed from a nearby pedestrian bridge. Now, I think these are not his words. Uh, this is an image from the construction process. And um, there are subtle things here, artistically speaking, speaking, architecturally speaking. Look at that light and those shadows. Otherwise, the building from the top indeed is a, 
you know, the house of God, you see the, uh, the cross of light. This is one of the most aware inspiring things I've seen in a minute. I'm not an overtly religious, but I can see finding God being relatively easy in a place like this. I don't know who wrote this, but again, um, enough about the cathedral. Now we look at the gymnasium, uh, which indeed faced the risk of demolition, and I think it was saved. Uh, another remarkable building by Kenzo Tange, uh, monumental, heroic, uh, uplifting, uh, outgoing. Um, why they wanted to demolish it is beyond me, but I think it was safe. Maybe they wanted to demolish it because they, the people who, who live here, uh, clearly have a different conception about uh, how a building should look like. And uh, usually the bourgeois and the domestic, domestically oriented people hate this kind of architecture. Because of course, this kind of building makes them feel uncomfortable. You know, they sit on their sofa and they don't want to change and they don't want to bring the new in their lives. And this building is telling, me, telling them, wake up. But I don't know, maybe it's just a banal uh, uh, parking lot uh, owner wanted to ravish it, to destroy it in order to build another parking lot. It's possible. Anyway, it was not, it was not destroyed. And again, the rocks. We need more rocks, I think. Um, the stones, those very stones that uh, Lina Bobardi wrote beautifully about them. You know, she compared them with the with the diamonds, and he, you know, he he preferred the stones, the rocks, to the to the diamonds. Again, it is a heroic architecture. Built with effort, of course, with hard work, with sacrifices, yes. Okay, Yamanashi Press and Broadcasting Center from 1967, another heroic building, look at it. It's like, uh, you know, uh, it does express its function, you know, uh, press and broadcasting center. It is broadcasting indeed, but it's almost medieval. It's almost paradoxical because it has somehow a medieval look, I mean, modernistic medieval look, and yet it is destined for broadcasting, meaning for being open to transmit, to, to send the uh, to send message outwardly and to receive messages inwardly. It is a fortress. Kenzo Tange. Only the mountains behind can compete with it. Unfortunately, in his later years, in my opinion, he, um, he lost something. And we are going to see a few buildings he built uh, before he died. Well, maybe it's inevitable, you know, uh, maybe the age um, does have something to say. But uh, he built some good buildings and we should appreciate him for, uh, for it. Yamanashi Broadcasting Center, Kenzo Tange.
And indeed, the broadcasting is crucial to our time, isn't it, and our culture. It is, uh, I, I wonder if we can live without it. The Fuji Broadcasting Center from 1990. Now you see one built many years later, and in my opinion is weaker, architecturally speaking. It's, uh, I don't know, it's contrived. I mean, when this, this sphere here is kind of, I don't know, it is here, but it could also not be here. Uh, to me, this is not a vital building. Uh, I'm sorry to say it, I admire Kev Zotange, but not for this building. And uh, not for uh, other buildings he built, including the City Hall of Tokyo, which is huge indeed, but uh, he was already affected. It's true, 1990 was that unfortunate period in, uh, in the history of architecture, and maybe not just architecture, called postmodernism. And uh, he still remained uh, a modernist. He didn't use, uh, you know, pathetically copied uh, columns from other, uh, you know, cultures and from a long time ago, like Ken Gokuma did. Ken Gokuma built a, an incredible, uh, in fact, you know, I mean, I'm joking, but not totally. If I, if I was responsible with the destiny of architecture in Japan, after Ken Gokuma built that building, in the 80s, I think, or early 90s, I would have taken his license to practice architecture. Please take a look. The Kengo Kuma built up, unfortunately, he uh, changed, but uh, he himself said that uh, th there are some things he did in the past that he's not proud of at all. Well, there are no reasons to be proud. Uh, it's true. He built a huge building with an immense uh, fragment of a column, you know, a classical column, a Greek column, you know, immense, and it's so ridiculous and pathetic, and the, the, you know, it, it's just incredible. But um, you know, uh, Ken, Kenzo Tange remained a modernist. He plays this sphere here, which is rather inconsequential. Anyway. Another broadcasting center, she's walk up press and broadcasting center, but this one, uh, unfortunately, I don't have the year here. I imagine it's before 1990 or maybe after. Anyway, he took his revenge. This is a fresh building, a nice building, a young people, uh, a young building, again, expressing uh, a heroic stance in life and in architecture. And uh, I think it was a success, this building, and is a success. Because it expresses freshness, uh, vitality, vision, that's why. You know, these buildings are just commercial, uh, banal buildings, but this is not. I think he's good with these cylinders, with these towers. He had them in that the broadcasting center that I showed uh, earlier also. And it has dignity. It has, it's audacious, but it has dignity. And I guess it's the dignity of the architect himself. The author, the so-called author. Because to broadcast means to, uh, you know, to move forward, to, to, to open up, to, to, to uh, to send messages, to receive messages. And, and, and this building is, said, is saying this. Its symbol is, to me, is uh, adequate. The one thing is for sure, Kenzo Tange was not a timid architect. And I think great architects are never timid. You cannot be a great architect and be timid. It's impossible. But the very act of building uh, is, uh, uh, is an act which, is, uh, which cannot be congruent with timidity. It's something that you make grow from the earth upwards. And uh, to, to be timid would be to contradict the very uh, moving upwards from the earth with what we build. But this doesn't mean that you, you, have, you have to be arrogant. No, 
this is the great difficulty to be not timid but not arrogant Tokyo City Hall from 1991. This is the building I mentioned, in my opinion, is not a success. It's huge indeed, uh, vertically, but I find it in, in its essence actually weak and uh, predictable. And probably his creative powers uh, began to diminish. It's possible. Plus, this building it expresses, uh, you know, an uh, a limitless bureaucracy, which probably is a reality for a city as large as Tokyo. But it expresses uh, authority and power in a rather, you know, conventional way, I would say, with symmetry. And um, there is something about it. it. It is as if it's not, it's not that Kenzo Tange that uh, I liked and admired the author of this house that he built. If I am to compare this building with this house, I see that uh, some years passed between this one and, uh, and, and, and the other building. Anyway, uh, now I end the presentation on, uh, on uh, Kenzo Tange with him as an urbanist, because he also worked as an urbanist, but in my opinion, an architect is an urbanist and a good urbanism is an architect as well. Palladio said it well, you know, uh, a city is a small villa and the villa is a large, uh, and the villa is a, uh, no, uh, no uh, a city is a, a large villa and the villa is a small city. He was, uh, uh, as an urbanist, he was proposing um, visionary schemes for developing, um, you know, uh, on water, uh, mainly, um, you know, a new, developing a new kind of city. Uh, and uh, he, he was not the only one. The, the, the other metabolist, he was himself involved with metabolism, tried to do the same thing. Uh, they were not build these things, but but still, I think they do have value in the field of uh, architecturally architectural thinking. Why did they do it? I don't think they were commissioned to do it. I don't think anybody asked them to do it. They felt that it was their duty as architects to propose uh, possible, uh, you know, urban developments for their own country, not only uh, on water, as you can see here. But here on water. Anyway, again, if we are to learn something from Kenzo Tange, is this total devotion to architecture, to creativity, asking questions, trying to solve problems, or even uh, you know, uh, bringing to the fore new problems. Uh, it's an active, it's an active spirit. Uh, here he was, here he was a, a, a very active architect uh, who who felt he had a mission, not just to build to make to make a buck, but to also propose the transformation of, of society and life. He felt it was his duty. It's possible his architecture office is still alive. They still build without him. Here he is contemplating his dream, one of his dreams.
Happy birthday, Mr. Tange. So design philosophies. Tange did not imagine himself as a leading for giver, although I think he was. He sees himself in a state of transition. The role of tradition is that of a catalyst which furthers a chemical reaction, but is no longer detectable in the end result. That's what he said. He also contributed in the metabolism movement. Many metabolists had studied under Kenzo Tange at Tokyo University's uh, Tange laboratories. Okay, and now we go to a very different architect, uh, the Italian uh, Aldo Rossi. Nineteen thirty one, nineteen ninety seven. He could have lived longer, but he had a car accident and died in it, just as Albert Camus died, uh, and uh, many others, unfortunately, in architecture. So Raymond Abra Abraham and others. Anyway, here he is, Aldo Rossi, a man with very beautiful drawings and uh, sketches, very lyrical uh, graphic representations of his dreams, but he also built a lot. Um, yes, I remember when I left the country, I ended at the, the University of Architecture in Venice and I asked the, 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 the doorman, uh, I, for some strange reason, I thought that Aldo Rossi could help me as a young and kind of lost uh, immigrant. And uh, he said, Aldo Rossi, well, he's a star. He only comes here to pick up his salary. Now that's what that doorman said. I don't know if it was true. Anyway, uh, here he is, uh, you know, with a, with a watch, a wristwatch that uh, he designed, I, 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 I think. Anyway, uh, he also designed yes, some mundane objects, but uh, including a, a belt. Here he is with his wife when he received uh, the Pritzker Prize. This I forgot to, to say. Both Kens of Tange and Aldo Rossi received the Pritzker Prize but not in the same year, of course. So, um, Premio Pritzker de Arquitectura, drawings. He drew a lot. In fact, some think that maybe his drawings are more valuable than his buildings, and it, there might be some truth there. He truly had a nice, uh, a nice way of, um, of drawing, you know. Uh, he drew like a poet of, uh, of the graphic arts. And usually what you see on his um, uh, graphic works is a mixture of various projects that he worked on, you know, various uh, works like here. So you can see uh, various buildings he built. He didn't build this tower, but he proposed it. And uh, so he uh, looked like here. Here is a, a building he actually built. And then here he has uh, just like in the graphic works of and, and the paintings of Giorgio Morandi, uh, he introduces, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting that uh, from these utilitarian, you know, uh, domestic objects, uh, they, they almost become uh, buildings. And he modifies the, 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 the scale. You see the building is, is, is smaller than uh, this spot. He seems to have sometimes also touches of, um, you know, of a relation with the metaphysical painting, which also prospered in Italy, like Giorgio de Chirico. There is something fantastic, uh, fantastical about his um, look at look at this, uh, uh, you know, uh, manner of representing architecture. You know, it's it's poetical, it's graphically engaging, enticing. Uh, he's not afraid of color. I really think he was very good at this. Aldo Rossi drawings. There are many books. This one was published by Skira. There is a risk though. It's true. Uh, there is a risk when you have a great ability to draw. Sometimes there is a risk of being uh, uh, seduced by the by the beauty of the drawing you make and forget about the specificities of the building you actually build or intend to build. 
Uh, this is a drawing for a cemetery he built in Modena, and we are going to see it. I, 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 like, I like his drawings very much. We didn't see such drawings in the case of uh, Kenzo Tange, but uh, again, very different architects, Kenzo Tange from Aldo Rossi, but both received the Pritzker Prize and both uh, deserve to, 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 to be studied and to be talked about and celebrated uh, on their birthdays and uh, on the day they died. He was a poet, of course. Now, yes, a poet who also designed a, a leather belt and a watch and maybe other things. Well, what can you do? This is a study for um, some buildings he built in, uh, in, uh, in, in Berlin. Um, this one as well, you see at the bottom Berlin and we are going to see them. We see, you know, uh, horses and uh, all kinds of things that, that that you know populated his imagination or his obsessions. Some kind of a cathedral, uh, cathedral again. He drew incessantly. He obviously loved to draw. Now the Teatro del Mundo. That which he proposed and built uh, in, in, for, for Venice. But well, there are cigarettes here and the Coke, uh, in the vicinity, almost neighbors of some of his projects. Why not? Uh, representation of his uh, study, of his project for the Modena, for the cemetery in Modena, which I visited. Uh, this is for a building in Japan, which he built. buildings and projects. Now, in 1960, he built, when he worked together with Leonardo Ferrari, um, a very interesting modernistic building, which is not a typical Aldo Rossi building at all. Um, looking at this building would be difficult to, 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 to uh, imagine the evolution of Aldo Rossi. Now, maybe it was the influence of his partner or also he was at the beginning, but an interesting building, this, uh, this building, and I think it deserves to be, to be studied. I see here insinuations of, Aldo, Aldo, uh, of um, uh, Adolf Loss a little bit. I also see some uh, resemblances somehow in the plan uh, uh, with uh, to certain pillars from the beginning by Peter Eisenman, uh, Aldo Rossi taught at the Institute of Architecture and Urban Studies in Manhattan, which a school that was which was founded by um, uh, Peter Eisenman. Anyway, uh, is this building uh, less a building compared to the buildings by Walter Gropius in the Dessau campus uh, for the Bauhaus? I don't know. Um, anyway, I, I think it's a good building, an early building by uh, Rossi and uh, his partner. I should have known his, uh, the name of his partner as well. A competition entry for this monument to the resistance. Unfortunately, I, I don't have the explanations, but I like the drawings. They are very, you know, uh, uh, schematic, uh, but in their minimalist, they do have uh, expressivity. This is what young architects do. They take part in, part in competitions, hoping that they will win, hoping that they will build. Monumento a la resistenza a Cuneo. The cube, the cube appears often in his work. A bridge in 1964, a bridge for the Triennale in Milan, 
um, a lesser known work by him. He built it. Uh, I was hoping I have other pictures, but anyway, I, it's one picture with this bridge that he built. Uh, and then uh, in 1965, a monumental fountain, a segrega segrate, now already there are, uh, you know, there are signs here of, of, of that Aldo Rossi that we know of. And we are going to see in Milan another work which is somehow similar with this one. When we arrive there, I will, uh, I, I won't even need my words because you realize the connection between what we see here and what we'll see there. I think in essence, the architecture of Aldo Rossi is uh, somehow uh, archetypal. It, he works with, um, uh, you know, formal paradigms. He, um, uh, but but there is a, an interesting mixture between uh, um, uh, a temporality or something a historical and historical, and also uh, with with something that might uh, might be described uh, through uh, words like uh, you know childlike or even infantile it's, it's a strange he was a very educated and sophisticated architect but his architecture sometimes aspires or aspired towards a simplicity a, a primal simplicity that somehow the world of the children might um, uh, connect with when we arrive at certain works i will try to elaborate uh, on, on, on this topic in a sense if if khan was right that uh, uh, beginnings are in harmony with the human nature and if the world of the child represents a beginning then uh, maybe certain things make sense a competition for the district of san rocco in monza well, you know, I just have these images of, 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 of their entry. A Monte Amiata complex. This is a, an important work. He worked together with Carlo Aimonino. Carlo Aimonino built his uh, vision of what the uh, housing complex sh should look like, and Aldo Rossi, his own. Uh, and we are going to see both. Uh, here is Aldo Rossi. And here is Carlo Aimonino. And you see there is a difference between the two. Uh, they, from the plan, they might appear alike, but you see the architectural expression is different. This is by Aldo Rossi. Um, and so this is in Milan. And uh, on the right is Carlo Aimonino. So Aldo Rossi, Carlo Aimonino very different architectural expressions. They were contemporaries, they were both Italian architects, but the expression was different. But I think that somehow they complement each other. Rossi began to use his uh, paradigmatic square window, you know, uh, you know, divided in four, just like a child would, uh, would draw with chalk on the sidewalk or on a piece of paper. Aldo Rossi in Milan, and on the right, Carlo Aimonino in Milan. Designed for a town hall in Scandici, 1968. Um, he began now to use the color as in his uh, sketches and drawings later. I will not insist on this, and I uh, can't uh, read now that uh, text anyway. An ossuary and the cemetery of San Cataldo in Modena. This is a work I visited. And uh, uh, it's an important work by him. Some would protest. What does this have to do with, uh, you know, a cemetery? But those, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, express themselves in a superficial way without uh, reflecting sufficiently. Uh, you know, it's, we are all puzzled by the end of life. We don't know what will follow. So this is a cemetery. This is his vision. You know, he has the geometry strong. It's almost impersonal. But the impersonality of death is a reality. 
uh, we become all equal in death and in a way nameless. Um, it's the city of the dead in a way. In his case, the city of the dead is not too dissimilar from the city of, uh, uh, of those who live. And this might be problematic, I don't know. Um, anyway, uh, I worked on these corridors. It's, uh, you know, it appears to be a rationalistic, uh, it's, a, it's a Cartesian building, but I think, I mean, look at those, uh, those openings in the walls and uh, it's 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 a carcass it's a carcass where the ashes of those who died are are stored uh, you know it, the symbolism of, of of this building would be that in in i would say in in death we become all equal there are no differences any longer uh, although in a conventional cemetery the you know, the emphatic uh, bourgeois and the uh, rich ones try to outlast death with, uh, you know, uh, flamboyant, uh, uh, you know, uh, structures. But this is not what Aldo Rossi says here. In, in, in death, we become all, uh, in death, we are all communists, if I am to risk uh, maybe a strange way to put it. We are all equal. Um, so what to make of this work, you know, the city of the dead? It's, I think it's a good work. And, um, you know, he, he aspired towards that primal quality of an architecture before architecture, if I am to express myself in this way. Yes, architecture before architecture. In Modena, Aldo Rossi. And a preliminary drawing. Uh, he won a competition with this work. Um, you also perceive probably the the motif of the cross. It's uh, you know uh, the cross is. Uh, insinuated uh, in this way in the physiognomy of the of the building now some might say because we are going to see two schools where he built an architecture that is not very dissimilar from this one so then you would say wait a minute you know uh, uh, if this is the city of the dead why should the city for the one who, the ones who are alive be not very different. Maybe it's a, a legitimate question. We'll arrive at those works soon. But I think he took his roles very seriously in this work. A design for City Hall, uh, 1972, um, you know, a sketch at least uh, here we see the fountain that we already saw built by him. And so there are certain elements that repeat themselves, it's true. A primary school, I mentioned already uh, a school or two schools that we are going to see. You see symmetry, perfect symmetry, and then uh, a, a building that is uh, different through its form and through its position within the plan, um, uh, probably an amphitheater. And here it is, you know, it's, uh, it's a school that some people might say it's too rigid, it's too restrictive, but I'm not sure of that because if you ask a child to draw a house or, uh, you know, several houses, a child probably would draw kind of something similar. Yes, the symmetry could be considered rigid, but um, his architecture has this uh, element of, um, you know, uh, an early age of, 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 of a preschool almost. You know, it's something I, I cannot easily avoid the word infantile. But it's an inform. I don't know. It, I, it's it's both uh, belonging to a. Um, kind of a, a preschool age 
and at the same time, uh, uh, you know, to to the history of architecture from an, an informed informed position. Look at the children now. Why the children are so aligned? Uh, I don't know. It's it's an older picture. Is who knows. <laughs> Personally, I'm a little bit bothered that they are, you know, in this way here. Uh, but uh, maybe this was not, I mean, I'm sure it was not the work of Aldo Rossi, uh, it was the work of the educator who placed the children in this way. Anyway, I don't think and I hope it's not the building that uh, suggested to them to, to be so rigidly. <laughs> I, I, it actually infuriates me this picture because the children should. I don't know why they don't sit, uh, you know, in a dispersed way, you know, to left, to right, to the, not in this way. It's uh, <laughs> it's something bothering me here. But look at the interior of the. It's a library there, you know. Uh, anyway, it's an interesting school. Uh, 1972-1976, almost you know around 50 years ago, uh, built. And there are elements of the metaphysical here as seen in the paintings of Giorgio de Chirico, you know, like here. And uh, you know, we are talking about a cultured Italian who was immersed in the culture of his country, and uh, there are connections with. Um, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with the art and other fields of, 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 of that very rich, very rich culture. Now this picture I like more because, you know, the children are children. They are not, you know, uh... anyway. Um, so moving forward, this is a school, now a single family, single family homes in Mozo, 1977. No, not very impressive here. Perhaps he was flirting with the idea of uh, not uh, leaving behind too far away what we call tradition. He is different, very, very different from Kenzo Tange. Teatrino Scientifico, um, a project that I don't think was built. But his drawings are a, a source of inspiration and his models and so on. The floating 250 seat Teatro del Mondo. This is, I think, a very poetical uh, construction by, uh, by Aldo Rossi, which was uh, made to float on the canals of uh, Venice. It's here, it's this, uh, it's made of wood. And uh, it floats indeed, look at it, uh, with Longena here and his uh, cathedral, uh, Baltasara Longena, the pupil of Scamozzi, and here is Aldo Rossi, and here is the water of the Venice Canal and the sky of God. What more do we want? It's not an ambitious work, you know, it's, it's indeed Teatro del Mundo, e mundo and it's, it's floating, it's, it's a light structure. And it's it, 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 it it's something uh, joyous about it, you know. And I like it, you know. I like the fact that uh, it flows. It's a dream building, uh, rather innocent, I would say, if you don't take into consideration, you know, the consumption of energy needed to drag it through the water, so to speak. But anyway, at that time, probably there wasn't a concern about um, the consumption of energy. Now here you see a building where Tadao Ando, and it's the only building in Venice until now where Tadao Ando has a, um, an intervention. It's, uh, he uh, created the interior of this. It's like a museum, art gallery. I don't know exactly. Uh, uh, and so Tadao Ando in Venice is here. Aldo Rossi. 
I love this picture. It's uh, one of the most poetical with his works. And uh, we need poetry, we need sensibility, we need emotion, we need culture, we need dreaming, we need all these things, otherwise our life becomes unbearable. Apartments in West Germany, in Berlin, I mean, former West Germany, in West Berlin. Uh, Berlin was wise enough to invite three times during the uh, 20th century great architects, important architects to build in the city, in uh, three colonies with, uh, you know, uh, housing uh, units. And this was done in the 80s, uh, beginning of the 80s, when he, uh, some other important architects were invited to Berlin. And now you are going to see what Aldo Rossi built. Uh, some drawing uh, uh, not far away is uh, Joseph Kleichus and Peter Eisenman and Rem Kolhas. And uh, there are other architects who built in Berlin, like Hans Hollein, uh, uh, Rob Krier, uh, uh, many. A very wise decision of Berlin. And again, this was done three times, not just once in the 80s, but also in the 30s and in the 50s. So now Berlin has three colonies built by, with, with buildings built by some of the most important architects of that time. You know, from Hans Scharun and uh, Bruno Taut and uh, even Le Corbusier has a unité d'habitation in, uh, in Berlin. Alvar Aalto has a building, Oscar Niemeyer, those built in the 50s. But now we look at works built in the 80s. This is something which Bucharest could do too, and maybe in some other city, invite important architects to build an, an apartment building. Um, anyway, Aldo Rossi, he built a lot in Berlin, as you can see, not just one single building. This paradigmatic, uh, you know, uh, window. This building is not by him. I don't know who designed it, but I, I have seen it. And it's not bad. But here it is. Here he is with his colors, vivid colors. Why not? Why shouldn't we use vivid colors in our projects? Why? Or should we use just 5% red? Uh, Okay, even the octagon and look at the redness, you know, why not? Why shouldn't we have this redness on our walls? Why not? A shopping center in Parma, 1979. Well, <laughs> you know, it almost looks like a temple, almost, but it's a shopping center. I don't know, you don't expect this kind of uh, facade for a shopping center, but that's what Aldo Rossi did. Um, what can we say about it? But people, you know, don't, they, they don't care too much about the architecture. They, they go to the shopping mall to buy things, to shop. That's why they do uh, go there and, uh, you know, uh, it's Bar Barbara Kruger, uh, would, uh, would uh, visualize, I shop, therefore I am. What would be life today without shopping? It would be inconceivable. A middle school, as I said, we, we are, we we're going to see two schools. Here is another one. And uh, by now, you know how a school by Aldo Rossi would look like. Here it is. Uh, not very different from the other school we saw. He found freedom in, uh, in, uh, in restriction, if I can say so. Look at the plan, it's deceptively simple. And in the center again, a round room. 
Aldo Rossi with Gianni Braghieri, 1979-1982. It's not perfectly round uh, as it was in, in that plan. It's an octagon, but uh, more or less still a, a round room. A monumental tower, which was not built for Melbourne, 1979. Here you see the, the project. And of course, he, he placed in the proximity of, I mean, of, of the drawing of the project, also other projects by him. Uh, he liked to do this, I guess, to, to situate a certain work within the context of his larger body of work. It was not built in Melbourne, Australia. Head office of this in Perugia. Um, yeah, uh, an office building. But the same archetypal uh, kind of architecture that this building could become a pot and the pot could become a building. A house in the United States, in the Pocono uh, mountains in Pennsylvania, uh, I would say is somehow uh, indulgent towards uh, the so-called tradition of the place. It's, um, yeah, it's a building by Aldo Rossi, but, uh, I don't know. I mean, it could have been done by someone else as well, probably. Now, these cabins, which you already saw in some of his drawings, you know, it's a cabin for the beach. Uh, it's Aldo Rossi, a genuine little Aldo Rossi uh, structure or construction. There, there it is. Totally Aldo Rossi. This is Aldo Rossi. If I am to choose a, you know, paradigmatic figure uh, for uh, for uh, all his works, in a way, is here. Now, uh, one in Turin, 1984-1987, not very different from the buildings uh, we saw in in in, in Berlin. Um, He built also in Japan, and not just one building, uh, 1986, 1989. As I mentioned earlier, this was a difficult period for architecture because of the that transitional style, as uh, Patrick Schumacher called it, um, postmodernism. But I think he did approximately a good job. Uh, it's, uh, it has a certain mysterious quality, you know, uh, with its frontality, uh, what is its function? Uh, it's, a, it's a hotel, but um, anyway, that's what he built uh, in, in Japan. He built another building and we are going to see it. It does have something Japanese about it somehow with a touch of that unfortunate uh, manifestation of what was called postmodernism. Here are, you know, drawings, um, and uh, here it is, the building in, the con in a larger context of the urban fabric. Well, Perfectly symmetrical. Welcome to pleasure. Bar, disco, bar. And the building by Aldo Rossi.
Well, some people were having fun, you know. Uh, I mean, we were approaching the end of the 20th century, but some people were uh, enjoying themselves. And I'm not talking about Aldo Rossi. I'm talking about those who um, envisioned a culture of uh, dancing and going to the bar, which still exists. I drink, therefore I am. Okay, uh, Lighthouse Theatre in Toronto. This is uh, a little bit different from other works by him, but you still recognize him. I don't know, uh, sometimes his works uh, are built in such a way that you wonder, are they buildings or are they models of buildings? Just like uh, there is the same with uh, John Haydock and this in my opinion, is a little problematic. You know, when a building looks like a model, I think it's problematic. But there are interesting things happening here somehow. Anyway, um, he also has this uh, air of being a stage design somehow. I associated this with uh, metaphysical, but uh, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, it depends what you mean by the metaphysical or what I mean by the metaphysical. Monument to Sandro Pertini in Milan. This one is, um, is, is the work I mentioned indirectly. I mean, I, I refer to when we saw something at the very beginning uh, at his, of his uh, uh, building activity that is not dissimilar with this uh, water coming out of a, a triangular, uh, you know, channel. And uh, a man consulting his uh, mobile phone and then some other people there on the steps. And uh, you will see that uh, there's water on the other side of this monument, as it is called, monument to, to Sandro Pertini. I don't know who Sandro Pertini was, Anyway, uh, so this is in Milan and it exists. A cube, a cube with water coming out of it through a, a triangular uh, um, channel and then on the other side uh, having uh, like an open air amphitheater. In the Netherlands, he built apartment buildings in 1989, uh, quite a large, uh, you know, uh, apartment building, uh, in fact, several, one near the other, I mean, one next to the other. Um, it's, I think it's not too bad and different from, from the works he built in Berlin. As you can see, he had quite a rich activity. And if he didn't have that uh, car accident, I'm sure he would have built uh, many more. So Aldo Rossi uh, in the Netherlands, a residential building uh, and former industrial area. Uh, yes, it was built again. You see the maybe, you know, it's a little bit too much. Uh, this is the third time, but maybe he did it more often than just three times. Um, <laughs> I see in the built work, there was not uh, any longer that triangle that brought water uh, downwards. I don't know what to think of this really. It's a little bit, um, well, it also has the, the disadvantage that it's a little bit flat, but uh, it, 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 it's not really a, a building that uh, communicates with the street. Now, maybe the street is not conducive to communicate with, with uh, too much, but uh, it, you know, it doesn't look like a housing complex from here at all. It's so opaque and blunt and blank. A clubhouse in Pisa. I don't know if it was built. It was. Um, you know, there are certain elements. I mean, the Italian rationalists, but you could also see some strange, strange mixture between a certain amount of uh, infantilism and uh, something fascist almost. You know, I mean, I, I know I'm on an adventurous ground here, but uh, 
and all these symmetries and uh, I don't know. Um, maybe I should abstain from uh, saying too much about this. Uh, the Walt Disney Company in Orlando in Florida. Now this saddens me that uh, Aldo Rossi, a sophisticated intellectual and artist from uh, Europe, um, you know, uh, felt uh, necessary uh, to contribute to the Walt Disney uh, empire because it is an empire. And um, personally, I think it's not a great thing that he participated, no. And I think that any architect would not have had a critical stance vis-a-vis -vis this empire uh, is to be blamed. And I would blame him. Uh, here he is with his triangle. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Why did he have to do it, you know, just to build another building to make the empire even stronger, even bigger? Contemporary Art Center uh, on the island of Vassivier in France. Um, this is a problem, you know, architects sometimes don't know when, when maybe it's necessary to say no. Uh, I know they have to run a, an office and a, an activity, but uh, I think an architect should also learn to say no. And when Louis Kahn said that a painter can uh, express his uh, opposition to war by making the wheels of the war machine square, and the, but the architect has to make them round, with all due respect for Louis Kahn, I would say that in the case of a war, and the tragedy of a war, I think an architect should also learn to make the wheels of the war machine square and not round to express the opposition to the war. And if the architect doesn't oppose the war, I think he is to be blamed uh, more than the architect, but, but maybe not so much more than the architect who says yes, to the lucrative, uh, vicious enterprises of the empire called Walt Disney, which in the name of so-called uh, the innocence of the child is actually doing uh, uh, things that uh, have nothing to do with the innocence of the, of, of, of the young. Anyway, this is in France, another building by Aldo Rossi, uh, a post office and apartments uh, near the city of music in Paris. This I always forget that he built in Paris too. Now here at the top, of course, is his gesture of uh, uh, contextualism, uh, mansard, uh, you know, the uh, top part of the buildings which in, in Paris are uh, frequently uh, encountered. Truly, this I always forget that he built in Paris too. Uh, Netherlands, this is an interesting, kind of an interesting uh, work, uh, 1995, um, but, but still very much uh, Aldo Rossi. He modified a few things, but in essence is indeed uh, Aldo Rossi. The interior is, uh, has some uh, interesting things. Uh, and even this uh, entrance here, which looks to me like a service uh, entrance uh, or doorways, um, has uh, some character and the uniqueness. Not so much the windows on the left and the right, which he seems to be reluctant to, to change. So it's a museum and we are going to see a picture or two from the interior as well. The plan in itself is not very different from other buildings he, he, he designed, like those two schools and uh, other buildings. He, but look at this interior. I don't think uh, he was responsible for this kind of art deco or neo art deco treatment of, of this uh, 
uh, top part of that uh, rounded uh, body of uh, building. Uh, it's interesting, but I, I don't think he was the author of this. Anyway, so again, himself in, in the Netherlands. Interesting that the Netherlands, you know, they have their own very skilled and uh, experienced and valuable uh, architects. They invite architects from other countries as well. And I wonder why we don't do it here in Romania. You know, maybe we can claim we don't have the money, but I don't think it's just about the money. I think uh, we are reluctant to invite architects from other countries to build here, although I think it would be a very good thing because it, it would emancipate the culture of architecture uh, and uh, would, would be challenging, would be inspiring. Anyway, maybe then we would also be invited ourselves outside of the country. But if we don't invite anybody within the country, then of course we, you, we, don't, we cannot expect uh, uh, you know, uh, a similar gesture from the outside. In fact, a similar gesture happens. We are not invited because we don't invite. It's as simple as that. Well, quite, uh, I don't know if there are elevators here. They should be in order to arrive there at the top, but he, for him, this um, uh, flight of stairs was important. A hotel in Japan, I said that he built another one and here it is different from the, the one that we saw. This was, was built later. Um, Japan again, itself, like the Netherlands, they have their own very important architects, yet they invite other important architects from other countries to build in Japan. The Netherlands do it or does it, Japan does it. And uh, I think uh, we could learn from this. Terra Nova shopping center. Now, why a shopping center is called Terra Nova when in fact it's about shopping until you drop. Um, I don't see too much Terra Nova in uh, shopping, in, in the activity of shopping, uh, but what can you do? Look at those columns there, which are, uh, decorative, of course, uh, but in a way they represent the truth behind, I almost said the false truth behind the um, facade of a shopping mall, you know, which is, which is meant just like a casino to, uh, you know, deceive you in order to leave the money there. And you do leave the money there because that's what the shopping center is about just like a casino. You go in to lose your money. The shopping center does the same thing, except that the shopping center gives you something in return. But the casino gives you the thrill, the thrill of losing your money. And we are approaching the end. This is a building uh, in New York City, the Scholastic Corporation from 2001. I think it was finalized after he died. Uh, is this building here, of course, and um, I think it's it's okay, you know. It, it, again, it, 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 he didn't try to mimic this building or this building, although there are some analyses that claim that, you know, there are obvious relationships between this building and this one. Well, they might they might be, but I don't think they are so ob obvious. Um, Anyway, so this is his building, Aldo Rossi, and not any of the others. But it seems a certain dialogue, so to speak, took place between these two buildings. And I think we have here an image about that. You see Aldo Rossi, uh, the location in Soho in, in Manhattan, the scholastic uh, building. Uh, I don't know what the function is, but uh, I know what the word scholastic means. Maybe it's a publisher there or something. A difficult context in a way, you know, squeeze between these two buildings and what to do to still assert yourself as being Mr. Aldo Rossi, but also not to 
provoke the anger of the buildings on the left and the right. And you see here, uh, you know, uh, the so-called dialogue between the Little Zinger building and the scholastic building, the columnar facade. Uh, I don't know. I mean, these columns are very different from what we see here. Same colors used, um, yes and no. I don't see too much whiteness here, while here the columns, which are massive, are white. Deeply recessed curtain walls. Well, to me, they are not so deeply recessed. To be honest with you, I don't know who wrote this. Construction technique use kit of parts. I don't know what this means very well. Anyway, so Manhattan, Aldo Rossi. Thank you. And I'm sorry he died.